I'd like to introduce Max Carter joining us from Greensboro, North Carolina, or thereby somewhere close. <laughs> right in the city. Thanks for joining us and with my friend speaking. Go ahead. Sure. Well, thank you very much. Good to be with you. Uh, and I know we have very little time as we lead into a worship at 1030 there, 1130 here. Uh, what I want to reflect on, and I hope will be helpful as we center down into worship in a moment, is uh, my wife's and my recent trip to Palestine with a small group uh, to participate in the olive harvest at the farm of friends of ours that we have visited over the years with our Friends United meeting service learning trips uh, to Israel and Palestine. We've done about three dozen of those over the years. Uh, the Nasser farm is just outside of Bethlehem, about a hundred acre farm that they've owned uh, since Ottoman times. But they are in a, what's called Area C of the uh, uh, oc military occupation, which means that they have no control at all over any decision they make. Uh, they are totally under military occupation, uh, and which means that their, their land is at risk of being confiscated. Uh, but they are practicing nonviolent resistance uh, in the best of Quaker and their Lutheran uh, ways. Uh, at the gate to their farm is a stone on which is inscribed, we refuse to be enemies. Even though over the last uh, several decades, they've had thousands of their trees, their vines burned, a bulldoze cut, have been physically assaulted. Uh, and the olive harvest is one of the times when they are most at risk because radical elements often sweep down on Palestinian farms and steal the harvest, uh, cut the trees, or otherwise try to intimidate them into leaving their land. But the presence of international volunteers at farms like the Nassers helps protect them. And since international volunteers have been coming to this farm, uh, since 2002, they have suffered no attacks during olive harvest, but have, as I mentioned, uh, suffered other attacks physically uh, on themselves and on their trees and vines uh, at other times. One of the highlights of our visit this time was the presence of so many volunteers uh, internationally from Germany, uh, the United Kingdom, Canada, the United States, including many young Jews from peace organizations that have been practicing solidarity uh, with Palestinians and Israeli peace activists in seeking a, a brighter future for all there with peace and justice. A highlight of that was one day when a young American Jewish college graduate uh, brought 200 grape vines from a Muslim organization that she was interning with to replace some of the 1,000 vines recently burned uh, by attackers. A young Jewish volunteer with a Muslim organization assisting a Christian farm. It's the kind of hope that uh, we see glimmers of over there on our visits. But each evening of our uh, daily work picking olives, and it was fairly arduous. You pick them olive by olive, uh, some seven hours a day, was our evening reflection of when we would gather in one of the caves where the original inhabitants of this farm lived uh, with Daoud Nasser, you know, the third generation farmer there, and reflect spiritually on the experience of the day. And one evening, the focus was on, so what is the role of the olive tree in the spirituality of Palestinians? And it was wonderful to hear the different reflections of both the farmers and the volunteers on the significance of the olive tree spiritually. Now for Palestinians, it is a central symbol. Uh, when you go over there, you see constant reminders of how important the olive tree is culturally, uh, spiritually, and economically. The olive tree and its produce provides 14% of the economy of Palestine. Whole villages uh, 
and some 80,000 families subsist on the income from, from those olives, both in uh, uh, the oil uh, primarily uh, and in you know, cons consuming the olive and soap. <laughs> olive oil soap is great. This is all I ever use on this uh, facial <laughs> hair. Um, and you see that represented artistically in uh, jewelry, in, in art, in song, in the traditional dance, the debka. And part of that is because the olive tree is deeply rooted in the land, as are the Palestinian people, whether they be Jewish, Christian, Muslim, uh, Baha'i, uh, Armenian, Coptic, you name it. Uh, all you know, Palestinians from time immemorial have been deeply rooted in that land. Uh, and the tree symbolizes that for them, that attachment to the land. Another deeply important uh, part of the role of the olive tree in their culture and their spirituality is that the olive tree is uniquely suited for that environment. It resists drought conditions. It only rains there between November and early spring. And then from March through October, it's absolutely dry. But the olive can persist through those drought conditions. And the soil is not overly deep. This is not your uh, uh, Francis Hole described geography of the soil of Wisconsin. <laughs> this is not deep loam. This is thin, thin soil uh, with deep rock underneath it and rocky, rocky soil. But it thrives in tough, tough conditions, just as the Palestinian people have. The leaves are evergreen, which again symbolizes for many uh, a long life, eternal life, and hope. Uh, and it sustains, as I've said before, whole families, uh, whole cultures, whole villages. And one of the other unique aspects of the olive tree is that when it appears to be dead, when it seems to be hollowed out and there's no life left in it, peasant farmers know to fill up the crevices with limestone, which is abundant there, the limestone rocks uh, in the fields, and eventually new life sprouts. We've seen this over and over again as we've uh, been in Palestinian orchards where gnarled, old, hollowed out, hundreds and hundreds of year old trees have new branches sprouting up from them with a bounty of harvest. Uh, some of these trees are over 2,000 years old. They're called Roman trees because they were there when the Romans occupied it. Uh, there are trees in the Garden of Gethsemane that we have visited that were there in Jesus' day 2,000 years ago. Uh, there are some that are over 3,000 years old. So for many reasons, it's a deeply symbolic uh, part of their spirituality and their culture. And I wanna share one moving experience we had with one of our friends, Raja Daoud a graduate of the Ramallah Friends School, lives very near the school still. All his children uh, also uh, went to that school. And 20 years ago, during one of the military attacks on Ramallah, uh, uh, an army bulldozer scooped up uh, the soil, uh, the rocks from the uh, surrounding garden wall, and some of Raj's family's trees and formed a roadblock in the, tr in the road that went past their house as part of a curfew imposed on the town. And after the army left, Raja went out and plucked one of the olive trees that had been scooped up and deposited in that roadblock and planted it back in the garden uh, as a show of we will not be subdued uh, we will stand steadfast uh, and we will protect our land and our trees. And that tree survived. And in our subsequent annual visits there, we always check on that tree. And most recently, we were gifted with uh, bottles of olive oil 
uh, produced from that tree. Again, a symbol of that steadfastness, resilience, uh, deeply rootedness, uh, and the importance of nonviolent response you know, through being rooted in the land. Uh, so as we prepare to enter into our centered, expectant, waiting worship, uh, I hope we can reflect on those qualities of trees that you know, may well be our own uh, hoped for qualities, steadfastness, uh, rootedness, attachment to that which is important, and the ability to withstand tough, tough times. So the query that I will leave you with as we enter into the silence is this. Where do we, or you, I, find new life when things seem barren? Where do we find new life in those thin places? Where do we find the will to survive, to press forward, to find hope when conditions are tough? Let us now prepare ourselves as we center down into worship, and I will look forward to being in worship with you.